In this mini lecture, I'm going to offer a primer on the concept of rhetorical agency. My thoughts on this are grounded in large part on Toni Morrison's Nobel lecture, where she as a narrator reads the old woman in her frame story as a practiced writer who thinks of language partly as a system, partly as a living thing over which one has control, but mostly as agency as an act with consequences. Now you'll notice that she says agency here and not an agency. Now agency is the capacity, condition, or state of acting or of exerting power. And it's also a person or thing through which power is exerted or an end is achieved. And an agency, on the other hand, is an establishment engaged in doing business for another or an administrative division of a government in particular. So the way that she talks about language here positions it not just as mere words, but as something that acts upon the world, that makes things and that makes things happen. Language is action, as opposed to what we often say, oh, she's not a woman of words, but of action or action speak louder than words. Rather, language is action. It's a mode of acting upon the world, and it's a medium because of this of ex exercising or exerting power. Now, I'm going to be expanding on this with my thoughts on rhetorical agency, which I define as the ability to establish and maintain relationships of influence with others and to be with and for those others through the symbolic systems that emerge from and shape our habitus. I'm going to break down the different parts of this definition, starting at the end with habitus. Now, habitus is a word used by scholars to refer to the always unfolding intra-actions among our bodies, our choices, and our surround. And I say intra-actions and not inter-actions because it suggests the idea that there is reciprocity between, among, and within the parts of the system as illustrated in this little model here in my Venn diagram with the two-way arrows, which speak to the idea of interaction, that they are, these bodies are, or these parts of the system are in relation with one another, they're interacting with one another, and by the overlapping circles, which suggests the idea that these things are imbricated or they're like scales, they overlap one another, they interact in this way. We can't separate them from each other, uh, but that's what we kind of have to do when we're talking about it and categorizing it. So um, I won't be addressing necessarily. Well, I'll, I'll try to address each of them individually, but again, keep in mind that these are imbricated or they overlap and they interact with each other. They are entangled in each other, these concepts. Now, the first one here that I'm going to look at is the body. This is the, uh, well, I think of it as the, the physiological systems, needs, and desires that make up this material thing that consists of my bones, my flesh, my organs, all the way down to my cells, my DNA, my genes. These things that are, de play, are a determinant factor in who we become. The body is, has a very, a very profound effect on who we are as individuals. Now, these, uh, well, they, they shape my, my genetic predis predisposition, shape who I am, my neural pathways, all of these things working together make up this material thing. Now, in this regard, since we're primarily concerned with language right now, I, I want you to think about a specific question here. How does our linguistic capacity shape and emerge from the physiological systems, needs, and desires that constitute our bodies? So how does your language making capacity grow out of and also shape your body? Think, for instance, about how language is grounded in your body. When you speak, what happens physiologically when you're speaking? And when you receive speech from someone else, when you listen to someone else, what happens in your ear? What does your body do as it translates those sound pressure waves into some kind of meaning in your neural pathways? So all of these things are grounded in the body. Also think of what happens when you're writing. Uh, or typing on a computer. These are very uh, physical somatic things that are bound up in our somatic system, in our body, the physiological systems, needs, and desires. Uh, 
Now, the body, of course, interacts interacts with our choices, uh, which I take as our individual and accumulated decisions. Now, no decision, as this suggests, is made in a vacuum. All of our choices are related and accumulative. They snowball into each other. What I decide today is tied to what I decided yesterday, and what I decide now positions me for the decisions that I will make in the future. So, which is just a matter of saying that our choices from one moment to the next determine and are determined by the limits of our being, our presence, our decision making in that moment. Now, our choices can enhance or hinder the range of opportunities and future choices that are available to us. So this is one way that our habitus is determined is by our choice. And again, in terms of language, I want you to think about how our linguistic capacity is shaped by and emerges from our individual and accumulated choices. How is your environment shaped by the things that you decide? How do those things shape you? Now, uh, just as with body, this is uh, choice is tied in very closely and interacts with our surround. Now, by surround, I mean our physical, social, and cultural environments. Our complex, multi-layered physical world, the world around us that both influences and is influenced by our being and presence in that space. Now, when I think of surround, I think of the, the place where we were brought up, our family, our friends, our home, environment, our education, our community, our socioeconomic status, religious upbringing, current religion, or the economy, politics on a local, state, national, and global level, and on and on and on. All of these things, they shape who we are. They play a determinant factor in the, well, just the shape of our lives. And again, in terms of language, I want you to think of how our linguistic capacity is shaped by and emerges from our surround. How do the things that you think, the words that you say, what you write, um, how are your ideas shaped by the world around you? And also, of course, consider how they're shaped by your choices and how they're shaped by your body. Now, the symbolic systems we should also be concerned with. Um, well, the symbolic systems of our lives we should also be concerned with because they emerge from and they shape our habitus. Now, these systems are systems by which individuals and groups make and share meaning experience. That's what I mean when I say symbolic systems. Things like language, art, music, religion, ritual, place, space, all of those things uh, well, our lives are embedded in all of these things. We participate in them. We perform them with other people all of the time. And of course, we're going to be concerned about language here uh, because, well, and especially rhetoric, because rhetoric is the study and practice of using these systems both ethically and effectively. So that will be our primary concern as illustrated by the relationships that are shaped in terms of uh, the interactions and the interactions that we have with other people. Now, this is, uh, well, these relationships include three basic things, the rhetorical relationships that make up what is called the rhetorical situation. Now, the audiences or the receivers of a message, the speakers, the creators of a message, and the way that they share the process of attention or influence. This is, we could imagine this, envision this in terms of more overlapping circles and two-way arrows and even a triangle here. Uh, this is, well, this suggests, again, the overlap, the interactions, the imprecations of these different things, the audience, the speaker, and the subject, or the thing that is for us, that we're giving our shared attention to, to borrow from Charles Taylor. Now, this the triangle at the center of this is the classic rhetorical triangle that some of you might be familiar with, um, in which... Any rhetorical situation consists of these three things. Again, the speaker, the audience, and the subject. They're always interacting with each other, and they shape any act of communication. We can't get away from that. Now, this also, of course, illustrates the ethical and effective of ethical and of that of. Uh, excuse me here. This illustrates the fact that ethical and effective acts of language are considerations of how words empower and how such power is exercised in a diverse range of human interactions. 
Now, I'm taking this language from Adam Gaffey in his discussion of rhetorical agency, but this is primarily what we're concerned about when we talk about rhetorical agency, how power is exercised, how power... Uh, well, how I share power with others, what, uh, what we're focusing on together, and how we bring those things into fruition in others' lives, which is what I'm concerned about when in my definition of rhetorical agency, I say that it's the way that we establish and maintain relationships of influence with others and be with and for those others. To be with them is to be present with them. I don't necessarily have to, as many dis, uh, definitions of rhetoric say, I don't have to be necessarily persuading them of something. I can use my language to be present with that person in that moment. I can share my intentions with that person and my desires with that person in that moment. Again, to refer back to Charles Taylor. And I can also be for those others. I can advocate for them. I can empower them through the language that I use and through the different symbolic systems, again, that emerge from and shape my habitus, the way that I am in the world, the way that the world interacts with me. Um, now, so this overall is the idea that we've been circling around and developing in the class so far, and which will continue to circle around and develop over the course of the semester, because rhetorical agency is at the core of what we're doing here in this class, and it, even in the university setting, is helping you to develop as a rhetorical agent to foster space in which you can develop in this way by recognizing, first of all, how entangled we all are in the matter and meaning of other lives. We can't get away from that. We can't get away from the fact that we're entangled with our environment, that we're entangled with the people who surround us. And we willingly and willfully entangle ourselves in these lives because the second thing that uh, we need to recognize is that these relationships, these interactions, bring richness into our lives. And they are vital to our thriving. As I've argued in my mini lecture on Morrison's revision, of the Babel story. We can't get away from this. We should be concerned about other lives, other languages, other narratives, and we should lean into our entanglement in these other lives. That's what we do when we are exercising, when we're practicing or performing our rhetorical agency. We consider all of these things and how we are sharing the power with others when we are making language. 